Hi friends, welcome to the Friends of France podcast. In this safe space, we are favored in each episode with the presence of an expert guest from different fields and specialties as we learn about their life journeys, their successes, possible regrets, and realizations, their work, why they do what they do, and even their life outside of work. In here, we tear down common myths and misinformation with up-to-date, evidence-based science and data simplified for anyone to digest. We don't shy away from topics that can sometimes be polarizing or taboo. We normalize the humanization of healthcare and its workers and we promote the importance of self-care and safeguarding your mental health. Please keep in mind that the conversations in this podcast are for educational and informational purposes only. They are not implied or intended to be a substitute for professional medical diagnosis, advice, or treatment. Please always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers regarding a medical condition. Are you ready? Let's go! Hi. There we go. Dr. Salas. Thank you so much. I'm good. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me, for inviting me to talk about this very interesting subject of obesity. Of course. I see that we have a common theme up up to the next today. It's quite cold in New York City (laughs) today. Better time. Finally, York, I love yeah, cold. New York weather is going around in circles. The other day it was like kind of hot, and then now it's it's back a little cold, and it's officially autumn pumpkin spice latte weather in New York City. I've been drinking pumpkin spice for a month now, so I'm like over it. <laughs> you, you started early. So, Dr. Salas, again, so honored to have you here. As you know, both of us are in New York, and you know how the gravity of how the pandemic started here in New York City back in 2020, right? And having worked in the COVID IC units at that time, I saw, and as you have seen, so many misinformation online about so many things, even prior to the pandemic, right? And I think there's a lot of misinformation online spewed by those who have no expertise in the subject. And I think one of them is definitely about hormones, but specifically also about obesity. City. And we see that it's, uh, because of misinformation, there's a lot of byproducts of hate against people, bullying specifically, and of course, lack of self-esteem in those who are being targeted by it. So there's no better person to talk about this than you, who is an expert and specialist in obesity and endocrinology in general. If you could first please introduce yourself to everybody joining us today, and thank you again for being here. Hi, I'm Dr. Rocio salas Whalen, and I'm an endocrinologist and also obesity board certified physician and I practice here in, in New York City but I'm originally born and raised from Mexico. Got it and let's not gloss over the fact that she's triple board certified by the way everybody. <laughs> so I know you said that you grew up in Mexico and I know that you also did your medical school in Mexico as well right and then yeah, you are training in residency here. I wanted to know what was your inspirations behind medicine? I usually like knowing where did this all spring from? You know, being a doctor, I think it was the only thing I wanted to be. I didn't have like plan A, plan B, plan C. It was just medicine. It was not a matter of what, it was a matter of when. So that's something that I always wanted to do. And in Mexico, diabetes is the number one cause of death. Mm -hmm. More than motor vehicle accidents, more than cancer. So I think it's the first disease that I grew up Mm -hmm. listening to. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, both my grandparents, Mm -hmm. grandfathers died from diabetes. My dad Mm -hmm. has diabetes. So it was just like something that is very familiar growing up. And that's why I, I incline into endocrinology. Yeah, I would like to say the same, like where I'm from, the Philippines, it's really diabetes and heart disease. Like both of my dad's side and my mom's side is like plagued by diabetes and also hypertension. And, you know, having come from Mexico and medical school and training here, the life of a physician is just long, right? <laughs> the education I mean, the is journey, long, definitely. The training yeah. The very trip, long. It's arduous, so many sacrifices involved mental, physical, emotional tolls in the body. Now that you're here, having your own private practice in New York City, having gone through all of that, and given all the sacrifices entailed, do you have any regrets in pursuing medicine at the end of it all? No, you know, I I think medicine is really a vocation. It's like Mm. a field of passion. Mm. And if it's not something that you cannot picture yourself not doing, Mm -hmm. you cannot go through the long journey. I think we go through it because that's our calling, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, and I remember my first semester in medical school, we started like 40 students. And at the end, we graduated half of that, right? So there's a lot of people started leaving because it's something that you really have to want it. Yeah, definitely. The amount of tenacity and 
grit and persistence, I guess, must be like unmatchable to really go through the medical process. And yet you made it, right? Like you said, diabetes is the first thing that you saw growing up. And now you're a specialist in diabetes and endocrinology. It's like all of your hard work and passion has now come true. And veering more closely into that in the field of endocrinology, would that be why you pursued the specialty, given oh. that as a kid? Yeah, you know, at first it was diabetes, so I always thought of endocrinology. Yeah. But once I studied the, the subject of mm -hmm. endocrinology in medical school, I, I found it really fascinating of hormones and how they regulate pretty much every function in your body and how the brain controls pretty much everything. So I found it really interesting, all the axes, their hormonal axes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, endocrinology in itself is like so complex, so diverse. I mean, there's so many organs and there's so many hormones involved. And I wanted to veer into a very important topic that we said earlier was obesity. And like you said, there's so much fogginess about the topic of obesity. I think because for many, it comes at a face level that, oh, they look obese. Oh, they're obese right but as a physician what are the clinical parameters of obesity is it just someone steps on a scale and you measure their bmi what is obesity like inherently and is it diagnosed just based on numbers unfortunately the criteria that we use currently to diagnose obesity is based on the bmi mm -hmm. But the BMI is a very poor tool to diagnose obesity. I feel like with the standards that we have right now of BMI, we're actually missing a lot of people mm -hmm. that can receive treatment just because they don't meet the BMI criteria, mm -hmm. right? I go further, and that's something that as obesity specialists we do. We go further than the BMI. I actually mm -hmm. I don't pay attention to the BMI. I mm -hmm. have other parameters that help me to tell me what who needs who will benefit from medication and who mm -hmm. wouldn't benefit from medication, right? Mm -hmm. So visceral fat is very important, and that's mm -hmm. one parameter that it, it indicate risk of disease and specifically mm -hmm. insulin resistant and metabolic mm -hmm. syndrome, type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. So somebody can have a normal BMI, but they can have very high visceral fat. Mm -hmm. That person requires treatment, right? Mm -hmm. Percentage of body fat is another parameter that I use to mm -hmm. diagnose somebody with obesity. And muscle mass is very important because mm -hmm. they can have a normal BMI, but they may have high body fat and very mm -hmm. low muscle mass. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. not healthy, right? Yeah. So muscle mass is also a very important parameter in metabolic health. Mm -hmm. But if we go to the current style, current guidelines is mm -hmm. BMI, and we mm -hmm. use the BMI equal or greater to 27, we consider that overweight. Mm -hmm. And a BMI equal or greater than 30, we consider that obesity. And then over 35 is obesity type 2. And then mm -hmm. over 40, which we used to call morbid obesity, we don't use that term anymore, mm -hmm. we call severe obesity, right? Mm -hmm. Hi friends, thank you for tuning into this episode. I hope you're enjoying our episode with Dr. Salas Whalen so far. But going to interrupt this episode just for a moment to give a new recording from Dr. Salas regarding an update on what she just mentioned about BMI being the sole diagnostic tool for obesity. This episode was actually recorded last year back in November 7th of 2022. And on June 14th of this year, 2023, we actually receive a new update from the American Medical Association or the AMA regarding the use of the BMI in diagnosing obesity and all of the harms associated with it the past few decades. Well, I'll let the expert come back and explain it to us all. Enjoy! Some exciting news. Last week, the AMA, the American Medical Association, released a new policy stating that the BMI should not be the only and sole tool to diagnose obesity, that we physicians should use other measurements beyond BMI to diagnose obesity. So this is huge, given that current guidelines limit who can use weight loss medication based on a BMI. So by expanding this, it will open the doors to many patients that may May require and may benefit from weight loss medications, but they don't meet BMI criteria. The AMA says that the BMI has caused more harm than well. It also says that it was used in the past as a racist exclusion and that all the data obtained from the BMI was only in white, non-Hispanic people. So leaving a lot of ethnicities outside. The AMA also states that the BMI should be used in conjunction with visceral fat, body composition, waist circumference, and that those measurements together with the BMI should be used to diagnose obesity and overweight. They also say, which is very exciting, that reimbursement of 
medication should not be denied due to not meeting BMI criteria. Now, this is going to be huge and insurances will fight back and it may take a few years before we see this implemented. But believe you and me, this is a huge step in the right direction. As someone with acne and blemish-prone skin, facial scarring and hyperpigmentation have always been my issues since high school. Acne has robbed me of my self-confidence throughout my schooling years, and having its visible reminders in my face to this day continues to do so. But I have found silver linings of hope having used RescueMD's DNA Repair Complex Serum. Plastic surgeon developed, RescueMD seeks to harness the powers of science and two decades of patient experience in providing a multi-benefit skin renewal serum that provides real results and improves the appearance of visible skin damage. Beyond my personal skin concerns, the serum also seeks to address the breadth of damage from varying external stressors, including hypertrophic and surgery scars, burns and chemical burns, cuts, scrapes, and bug bites. All of these are targeted by supporting the skin's natural healing process through its infusion with RescueMD's patented LabCall, a proprietary anti-inflammatory skincare technology that targets skin damage at the DNA level. The serum also contains a hand-selected blend of other ingredients such as peptides to help strengthen the skin, botanicals like rosehip to soothe, and moisturizing agents such as dimethicone and allantoin that helps to speed up skin recovery. The DNA Repair Complex Serum has been my daily friend, and every day, I feel like I can take back what my scars have stolen from me. Definitely, each skin is different and results are not guaranteed, but I hope that you can find your silver lining too. In partnership with RescueMD, you can get 15% off your order on rescuemd.com with the code FOF15. The serum is also now available on bloomingdales.com. Discover what healthy skin healing means with RescueMD. Growing up with my mom, who has been a nurse for the past 30 years, I would always take an adventure in her bookshelf filled with nursing and medical textbooks, encyclopedias, and various human anatomy posters. I still remember perusing through an encyclopedia as a six-year-old, trying to look for pictures of eyes and muscles, attempting to pronounce their lengthy names since I could not really understand explanations about the different body parts. Despite the myriad of children's books with topics ranging from magical universities to talking animals and the different types of rocks, there weren't really any books in the workings of the human body when I was a child. For children, Written by physicians, Dr. Betty and Dr. Brandon, the Medical School for Kids book series now provides a charming, easy-to-understand introduction to the wonders of the medical field. These books feature beautiful illustrations and simple explanations, teaching children and adults alike about the anatomy, physiology, and diseases of the body. From distinguishing a normal mole from melanoma, to discovering the importance of eating healthy food for heart health, to knowing the vital signs that are monitored in the operating room, people of all ages can truly learn something new through these books, as they are designed to teach real medical concepts to readers of all ages in ways that anyone can understand. Take an educational adventure into the intricacies of every organ system of the human body. Paperback copies of the books are available for purchase on Amazon.com and eligible for two-day prime delivery. Kindle versions of the books are also available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. You can also visit the website md4kids.org for more information. Get ready for an adventure on the medical school bus! All of these numbers and all of these guidelines, it can truly get confusing for many people, right? And, you know, being from other countries too, I don't know if you watched this video where they were trying out McDonald's and when they showed the size of Coke, they're like, Oh, that's probably from America. You know, America has this reputation of just obesity. And even though it seems to be a flagrant issue, there's also not much of urgency as there is. And that's my question to you is, should there be an urgency when it comes to obesity, when it comes to public health, in the sense that without really getting to the nitty gritty of the pathophysiologist, how harmful is obesity to the body? In fact, what does it do to the body? Answering your first question, I do feel yeah. there should be a sense of urgency. Yeah. The New England Journal of Medicine published within this month an article saying that 
by 2030, half of the population in the U.S. will have obesity. Mm -hmm. One in every two Americans will have obesity. Mm -hmm. So greater than diabetes. 72 mm -hmm. million people in the U.S. have obesity versus 37 with diabetes, mm -hmm. right? So definitely it's our biggest chronic disease mm -hmm. that we have right now. So there is a huge sense of urgency, mm -hmm. right? Obesity causes many health problems and we can go mm -hmm. by even by organs, right? I mean, yeah. if we go by liver, it can cause fatty liver cardiovascular yeah. disease, stroke, yeah. mental health disease, not just physiological, but also psychological, insulin resistant, right? Type mm -hmm. 2 diabetes, metabolic mm -hmm. syndrome. Mm -hmm. And then we have mechanical problems, arthritis, sleep apnea, which decreases mm -hmm. sleep and increases mm -hmm. mortality. There's more mm -hmm. than 30 cancers that are associated mm -hmm. with obesity. Mm -hmm. Breast cancer in postmenopausal women is right now the number one cause is obesity. It's not so mm -hmm. much genetic. We're not seeing that much anymore that is genetic or runs in the family, mostly caused to obesity, endometrial cancer, prostate cancer, mm -hmm. stomach cancer. So it's really high risk for many debilitating diseases and all cause mortality. Yeah, I mean, when I was talking to my coworker the other days, I was telling her how we're going to have the talk tonight. And I was saying how, as we were going through our patients list for that day, I was like, isn't it interesting that the comorbidity is always like obesity, obesity, obesity. So you're right, dog. It's like, the sense of urgency like really should be there. But I wanted to bring it to our topic to that patient who goes to you and I guess will get their first diagnosis or their testings or their BMI for obesity. And we see this also on social media where I think the conflation between overweight and obesity, right? Many people lump it together into one ball of, oh, it's their fault because they're in eating unhealthily or they're not exercising or they have poor life choices. Is there a blame to be placed on the person? I want to frame the question that to who, if there is, should the blame be placed to? And if not, where is obesity really coming from? Where is the source of all of this? You know, I've practiced obesity medicine for three years and I haven't met a single patient, a single patient that hasn't done anything possible to modify. Nobody wants to have obesity. No single patient yeah. chooses to have obesity. That is a complete lie. These mm -hmm. patients have struggled decades of their life with weight. Their life revolves around their weight around that, that plate in front yeah. of them, right? So this yeah. is not, a, I mean, nobody's going to choose this lifestyle. Mm -hmm to begin yeah. with, right? Yeah. And I think that the conflicting issue here is that the concept of obesity as a chronic disease is relatively new to us in America. And we were just accepting it as a true disease, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can argue that diabetes could be lifestyle, right? But mm -hmm. we remove the shame, we, we accept yeah. it and we treat yeah. it. We can argue yeah. that high blood pressure is can also be mm -hmm lifestyle right but yeah. we've moved yeah. from that mm -hmm. and now we see it as a disease and mm -hmm. when we treat it right so mm -hmm. obesity is that's what's happening with obesity now the who classified obesity since 1942 as a chronic disease oh wow that's the cool. american medical association 60 years later in 2013 mm -hmm. they classified they accepted obesity as a chronic disease Mm -hmm. Right. So obesity is multifactorial, is caused by multiple factors. One is lifestyle. Definitely mm -hmm. it can contribute mm -hmm. to it, but it doesn't make it or break it. Then we mm -hmm. have genetic factors, right? There's mm -hmm. a very strong, usually family inheritance of some mm -hmm. genetic of obesity or overweight or gaining weight. Mm -hmm. And there's hormonal causes mm -hmm. like PCOS, menopause, mm -hmm. hypogonadism, insulin resistant, right? That promotes waking. Aging is another factor that, that we cannot modify. And then we go to environmental causes. And the perfect example is that person that moves from another country to the United States and gain weight right? Mm -hmm. So it's food industry, industrialized countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, the toxins, the endocrine disrupting chemicals that we expose, mm -hmm. the plastic, the pesticides, the chemicals, mm -hmm. all those can promote obesity. So if you think mm -hmm. about it, the person only has control of one little piece of the whole mm -hmm. equation. Mm -hmm. Everything else is going to be there and, and all of them are non-modifiable, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. really we cannot blame somebody from their genetics. Mm -hmm. Right. We cannot blame somebody for their aging mm -hmm. or their hormonal state or where they live and how they work. So that's why we have to take up the blame of, of the person. Right. Yeah, I love that. And 
It's true though. Like the people who do suffer from obesity, right? It consumes their life. That's all they're. That's all they think about, and it's not even helpful at all. That when they scroll down social media, you feel like their identity is defined others, but others too because of their weight or how they look like or how they present, right? And just hearing that even the big associations of medicine are saying that it is a chronic disease, that it is multifactorial, and that it is not your fault. I can't imagine the amount of relief also for your patients who have tried everything. Right? How much of a peace of mind and how much of a hope and reassurance that that gives them, and veering into obesity being chronic disease. There's so many diseases in the world, and most diseases they have ways that we can avoid them, or we can prevent them, or even we can treat them. Right? Medications or possibly lifestyle changes, and sometimes with the help of different industries like the food industry or even the government. With obesity being a disease, what are ways now that Current medicine has given us to treat obesity, if there are. So finally, we can do something <laughs> different for patients besides eat less and exercise, exercise <laughs> more, right? I mean, I feel like we were beating every patient with that, and mm-hmm. they were not losing weight. The patients mm-hmm. got frustrated, and we as physicians got frustrated, and then we stopped mm-hmm. talking about it. Yeah, right. Absolutely. We got comfortable treating all the complications of obesity mm-hmm. because we had the medications. We can because we can actually do something. The patient mm-hmm. was happy. We were happy, mm-hmm. and we we can treat diabetes. We mm-hmm. can treat hypertension. We can treat all the complications from from obesity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now, actually, we can treat obesity. Right now, mm-hmm. we can actually prevent and be very proactive and prevent all the complications from mm-hmm. obesity. So we have medications that we can use to treat obesity now. And I'm sure everybody has seen in social media, right? Certain medications more than others, but we we have medications that we can use to treat. We don't cure it. We control yeah. obesity, right? Mm-hmm. The definition of chronic disease is that it's relapsing yeah. and it's chronic. It's mm-hmm. not curable. Right, we can control it with medications, interventions, lifestyle, but we cannot cure it. Right, and if we could veer more into that, if there's one medication that you would like to explain to everyone here today, I guess what we hear about like Ozempic and all of that, how did those work when it comes to treating obesity in itself as opposed to the complications of it? You know, and there's a lot of stories in medicine of medications that were designed for one thing and then. They, they work for something else, right? Yeah. So this type of drugs is a perfect example. They're called incretins. Mm-hmm. And the first incretin was discovered in 2005 in the mm-hmm. saliva of a lizard. It was, <laughs> it was here in Mount Sinai in the Veterans Hospital by an endocrinologist here in New yeah. York, which is yeah. really cool. And the way that this hor- their hormones, their synthetic mm-hmm. hormones, we make those hormones in our gut, but they're very short-lived. Mm-hmm. So Mm -hmm. these are a synthetic form of it. And the way that incretins work, the reason that they were used and reproduced was for diabetes because Mm -hmm. they work in the pancreas. Mm -hmm. When your sugar goes high, it kicks in the pancreas. You make more insulin. You become more insulin sensitive. And that's how it works for diabetes. And that's what we started using it for. Even I I can say back then in 2005, the first one was Bayera. It was a twice a day injection. So Mm -hmm. we've come a far, a a, a long way now. It's a once a week. Before twice a day, patients would have to inject themselves. But when we were prescribing this to patients, they were coming back with much better glucose control and mm-hmm. weight loss. And up to that point, we didn't have any medications for diabetes mm-hmm. that causes weight loss, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, actually, some of them can cause weight gain, insulin, yeah. sulfur, yeah. Ureas, the yeah. piolitazones, they mm-hmm. can cause mm-hmm. weight, weight gain, right? So this was the first medication that we were like, oh, it's treating both things. And, <laughs> yeah. then, and then we started using it off-label for weight loss, and then eventually we got the FDA approved for, for weight loss, right? But the way that target weight loss, we talked about how they work for diabetes, the way that they work for weight loss and obesity is they work with your appetite hormones. That's one way. And the other way is that we have receptors in the amygdala for these hormones, mm-hmm. and it dissociates any positive reinforcement from food. Mm-hmm. So any comfort eating, emotional eating, you don't get that feedback anymore from food. Mm-hmm. You, you may reach for it, but then you, you don't feel nothing and you stop. For many patients, even with alcohol, it can happen. It's just because of that anticipation yeah. that you want to receive from certain food and mm-hmm. drinks, right? And the way that they work in the gut area, they increase your satiety hormones and they decrease your hunger hormones. So that's how it works for weight loss. All throughout high school and bouts of college, I suffered from severe acne. I cried almost every day looking at the mirror. I wore hoodies during the summer to hide my cheeks. 
When my mom asked me what I wanted for my birthday, all I wished for was a visit to the dermatologist. I tried so many products and saw so many estheticians, physicians, and other advanced providers. But I know that my mere access to these products and providers is a privilege. Many who suffer from acne and other skin conditions live in many underserved populations where access to dermatology specialists can be difficult due to limited resources. To help bridge this divide, Vanna Padilla, a dermatology nurse practitioner, recently launched Your Skincare Experts Derm Course, which can allow other specialties to provide comprehensive care to patients through dermatology in places where access may be limited. The course can also be used to help better train extended providers within the field of dermatology to feel confident and empowered in their knowledge. From fortifying skin anatomy to identifying skin types and concerns, breaking down acne, building skincare routines, and going over active ingredients, the course seeks to further knowledge in skincare, anti-aging, acne, and overall holistic skin health. Friends of France is partnering with Your Skincare Expert so that you can get 10% of the course with the code FRANZ, that's F-R-A-N-Z, or visit yourskincareexpert.com slash FRANZ. My skin and my life were changed by the right products and the right people. Through this course, I hope that this would also be made possible for others. Anyone who knows me knows that I love boba. After a heavy dinner? No problem. I have a second stomach for boba, and sometimes even a third. But each cup of bubble tea is definitely a guilty pleasure, given that the average cafe-made milk tea has over 100 calories per serving, over 20 grams of high glycemic sugar, and is packed with artificial flavors. I am so glad that the guilty days are over with Twirl, the world's first canned, plant-based milk tea, with only 45 to 50 calories per serving, and containing 6 to 7 grams of sugar, and low glycemic sweeteners at that, goodbye to sugar crash, Twirl is made with pea milk, the most sustainable plant-based milk on the market, regenerating the soil where it comes from. This is thanks to the fact that fair trade and organic are the names of the game, as the teas are sourced from biodiverse family farms in China, Japan, and Taiwan that practice sustainable farming techniques. No artificial flavors are ever used. Choose from three antioxidant flavors of the chocolatey Taiwan-style black milk tea, floral jasmine, and nutty hojicha. Enjoy all of these flavors, each being nitro-infused that you can feel and hear their fresh, silky, and creamy texture with each pop of the can. Let's enjoy tasty, creamy, shelf-stable, and healthy milk tea together for 10% off using the code FRANZ10. That's F-R-A-N-Z-1-0. Now available on twirlmilktea.com or Amazon. Twirl around in its goodness. It's amazing how advancements in science and medicine and medical technology can truly change lives, right? Like things that we can't imagine probably in the past is now allowing to give people hope. But beyond like the science, beyond the medicine and the pharmacology of all of this, I think a big change also in people's lives that give them reassurance are the people they talk to, especially the physicians that they consult, right? And one of them being you. I can't imagine people coming into you to see you after years or even decades of trying or probably seeing or hearing their friends or families passing away due to complications of obesity, right? And now it's true for them. If there's someone somewhere in the world who is struggling and suffering from obesity and feels like they have done everything that they can do, what would be your word of encouragement or advice to them as someone who sees this every day, who has seen the highs and lows of people who's going through this disease and just feels like there's no more hope for them. It's a very, it's a very personal yeah. journey for every patient, mm -hmm. right? And unfortunately, some patients still feel that it's their responsibility, that it's their duty to lose the weight, right? So we're holding very tight to that concept of mm -hmm. lifestyle and, mm -hmm. and obesity and that the, the patient has the power and the control to change if it really wants to change, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that patients have to recur to very extreme lifestyle changes that are not sustainable, that they're setting themselves to failure with such restrictive lifestyle, diet, exercise, that is not sustainable, right? So mm -hmm. then they feel like a failure. And mm -hmm. for many patients going or asking for medication, or even when the medication is presented to them, there's a lot of resistance still because they feel guilty that they're taking the easy way out, that they're cheating, that they shouldn't work harder, right? 
So when we explain to a patient, like, this is not your fault, there's nothing you could have done to bring it on 100%, and there's nothing you can do to make it better 100%. Mm-hmm. For many patients, that's very liberating. Mm-hmm. For many patients, the first time that they feel like, oh, like relieved. So I think if they know that they struggle with weight, right? And, and mm-hmm. most patients struggle when we're talking about obesity, mm-hmm. most patients have struggled through their life. Mm-hmm. I always ask the patients the same question. How young were you that you remember that weight was an issue, that you had to watch what mm-hmm. you ate? Puberty, nine, middle school. Mm-hmm early childhood. So it has very similar early beginning. So Mm -hmm. if they struggle through their life and they're not seeing the results that they want, I would suggest an obesity board certified physician because Mm -hmm. not every doctor has this idea Mm -hmm. or this concept yet because it's relatively new, right? Mm -hmm. And many physicians are not comfortable with the weight loss medications that we have. I feel like more and more they're getting comfortable, which is great. Mm -hmm. But I would say an endocrinologist, an obesity board certified physician, they can go to the obesity board medicine website and find mm-hmm. their area. But to be proactive and seek help and, and be open to what we can offer them, right? Yeah. You know, hearing you say all of that makes me kind of emotional because I feel like I can feel for the people who come to you for help or even are inside their homes and hiding their whole lives, you know, like we said, like consuming these thoughts of, it's not just also what they think about themselves, but also what society also places on people, right? Like lots of lots of labels, lots of blame, which ends up blaming yourself. And uh, truly like obesity, it's not just a physical disease, but it seems as though it also consumes you mentally and emotionally, a lot of psychosocial implications. And you hearing these stories, How do you decompress out of work after hearing all of these outpourings of emotions and places where people want to see themselves in but haven't been able to for, I guess, their whole life? How do you decompress out of work? How do you do self-care out of work after hearing all of these gravity? (laughs) You know, it's very it's very fulfilling what I do Mm -hmm. and and I feel really privileged to be part of their journey, right? And to see how they can flourish and to be the better persons that they are. One very interesting thing that happened that I'm, I'm and, and again, medicine, obesity medicine is new, right? Yeah. So I'm learning still, right? I'm, 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 this is all trial and error and yeah. see what works better. But what I'm seeing in patients, which is really interesting, is that they have so much more mental space Mm. to pursue other things when you remove the obesity, the dieting, Mm. the thinking about their food. It's like they open, you have this mental space that they can do something else, right? That they can think of something else. And that's very liberating for patients. So honestly, for me, it's very gratifying what Mm. I do. And when I can see that switch and that change Mm. in the patient, I I, I don't need to decompress. I mean, it is absorbing an energy, right? Mm. But it's what makes me wake up every day and and want to do what I do. I always say patients do as much for us as we do for them in a, in a different way, right? So for me, that's that's really good for my soul, and it just keeps me wanting to do what I do and keep going. Definitely, Dr. Salas, you are amazing. You are such an inspiration. I am a big fan, and I am so grateful that you spent your night today to talk about (laughs) important topics that I really have been wanting to break borders about because it's it's such important topics that can literally cost the life of someone right because it's such as multifactorial of a source obesity is it's also multifactorial and its effects on a person or a community right so Dr. Salas thank you so much I'm so grateful for you one thing that I would like to say mm-hmm. is, or I, I would encourage patients mm-hmm. to share, right? Because mm-hmm. I feel some patients, there's still that shame or like, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. taking the easy way out. Yeah. I feel, really feel like the more patients share their journey mm-hmm. and their experience with the mm-hmm. weight loss medications, and with, it, it's going to open the doors for other people to reach out and, and, yeah. and do that, right? Because many patients, they still like, people notice that they're losing weight and they're not saying that on medication. So yeah. we're just propagating that idea. They're like, oh, yeah. they exercised yeah. and they were able to lose weight with exercise, but maybe <laughs> really they're on medication, right? Yeah. So I feel we should be more transparent because 
that's going to really open the door for other people that are considering but are not there yet to yeah. really take that step down, right? Yeah, and somebody said she's a terrific doctor. She can change her life. And I truly believe it. Dr. Salas, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Enjoy your fall cold <laughs> weather. And I know you're looking forward to your pumpkin spice latte tomorrow. Me too. Tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Salas. Have a good night. Everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. We have now reached the end of the story. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Friends of Franz. I hope you had an enjoyable adventure learning about our expert guest, their work, and why they do the things that they do. Please check out the rest of the series available on all podcast platforms. Please also consider following the podcast on the platform that you prefer. Turn on the alerts for new episodes so you don't miss new stories. And give us a rating to support the show. You can find more updates on the podcast's official Instagram at Friends of France Pod or my personal Instagram at Chris Franz. That's without the I because there is no I in team. <laughs> I'm kidding. Someone already took the username. Have a great day or night, everybody.